there's a lot of work being done nowadays with psychedelic therapy. There's a rebirth in psychedelic therapy recently. Yeah. Um, and in the UK in particular, that is being run by Robin Carhart Harris and mostly psilocybin. Why would psilocybin work for, and they're using it often to treat depression, yeah. why would psilocybin work for depression? Well, so a primary question is why are we even looking at psychedelics? So we're looking at psychedelics for two reasons. One is that as I mentioned earlier, mental illness is burgeoning in this society. Uh, anxiety is the fastest growing diagnosis on both sides of the Atlantic. And more and more people are depressed. And uh, some of the reasons are, are mentioned in Johann Harry's book, Lost Connections, where he talks about just the loss of human communion, which is not the only, but certainly a major factor. So for, for social reasons, mental illness is, or mental discomfort is rising. Number one, number two, there's the largely complete failure of the Western medical system in which I was trained and practiced to deal with the crisis of mental health. We don't understand it. Uh, I could go into the many reasons we misunderstand mental illness, but fundamentally we're in denial about the unity of, of, of the human soul and the mind and the body, and we're in denial about the social nature of human beings we look upon mental illnesses, biological problems. So people are looking for solutions outside the mainstream, uh, as, they, as they have to, because within the mainstream, the responses and the preventions are so inadequate. Now psychedelics, psilocybin, uh, specifically, but not exclusively, get to a part of ourselves that usually we're not in access of. So they get to the, the unconscious part while we're conscious. So we get to experience our unconscious while conscious. And we can see what's in there. Now why on the physiological level uh, the psychedelics do that? I have to keep looking it up. I just, I'm not keeping in my head the particular neuroscience and brain physiology that's involved. But clearly, parts of the brain are being activated that are usually uh, are shut down or we have no access to. And so psilocybin has been used in two ways. It's been used as single, fairly large dose experiences. And through those experiences, people get in touch with parts of themselves they usually have no access to. For example, they might have a deep spiritual experience, a deep experience of unity a deep experience of their true self, part of their real self that usually are shut down from their uh, daily experience. Well, that could be tremendously healing. W what if I no longer saw myself as an isolated little ant crawling around for survival in this huge ant heap, but as a meaningful and genuine part of a larger whole, and that unity is unshakable? no matter what happens to me and no matter what I feel at a particular moment? What if I could be conscious of that unity? It, it gives you a totally different experience of life. So along with the other psychedelics, psychi uh, uh, psilocybin can do that. And what's striking is that it doesn't matter what the psychedelic experience, when people describe their experience of unity, it's all the same language. And it's all the same language if people get there without psychedelics. So either everybody's hallucinating and everybody's crazy, or they're having some genuine experience of something that's deeper than our usual consciousness can permit. And that's what happens, I believe, with psilocybin. Then people also use it, and this is still experimental, on a microdose level, where people are not using it to have this deep experience. In fact, they might have a, an amount that doesn't even give them an altered consciousness in the short term, but over a couple of weeks, microdosing where they might use for two or three days and then not use for a few days, but in a small, barely perceptible dose, it alters their brain physiology in such a way that they're no longer addicted. In, in, in which case, they're using it like an antidepressant. The difference is they don't have to use it every day, they use small quantities, and they don't have side effects, which, and I've taken antidepressants, I'm not against them, but, you know, they do come with side effects sometimes. And what are the risks of this kind of therapy? Well, the risk is 
really only that if people have experiences they can't handle and leaves them unmoored. So uh, these experiences, these plants traditionally, and, and the mushrooms have been used traditionally by native peoples. Ayahuasca has been used traditionally by native peoples. Iboga has been used traditionally by native peoples in Africa and Latin America and North America, peyote and so on. But this was always in a context, always under the guidance of very experienced elders who'd been through their own experience. Now in our world, we tend to be kind of anarchistic and individualistic. Uh, sometimes people might use these substances who are not ready for it, who have not been prepared for it, and it might release emotions and visions in them that they don't know how to integrate and how to handle. So I've seen a few people lose it as a result of psychedelic experiences. I've not seen personally, I know of some, but I've not seen any tragic outcomes, but I've seen some difficult outcomes. So the risk is using it when you're not prepared and not under appropriate guidance. Now, some of these substances should also not be used with certain people with various mental health conditions. For example, if you have a history of mania, you better not use ayahuasca, I don't think, because it can trigger your mania, or LSD for that matter. Unless you're with, working with somebody who's very confident and can be with you over time and integrate and hold whatever happens to you. So again, it depends on context, but there are certain kind of indications. Because obviously there was a huge enthusiasm for these substances in the 50s and 60s. There was a lot of really amazing and very promising work going right. on. And then the entire field was shut down. What do you think are the lessons that can be learned from that to avoid something like that happening again? So in the 50s and the 60s, two kinds of work occurred with the psychedelics. The first work, which preceded the second, was very responsible, scientific, research work. And some very important work was done with LSD, uh, for example, in Canada and in North America and perhaps elsewhere, uh, where they found some very positive results in its impact on mental illness. That was scientific work, very rigorous. It may have had its flaws, but the intentions were purely to advance science and, and, and human health. That then got coupled in the 60s with the cultural explosion of psychedelics with the anti-Vietnam War movement, the whole alienation between generations that became very apparent in the 60s, the whole mistrust of tradition and, and elder guidance, uh, not to mention the massively experienced need to escape from the rigidity of the mainstream culture. A lot of young people got involved in using, using psychedelics, not traditionally, not under guidance, and certainly not under any kind of scientific inspiration. So a lot of people used it, and there was a lot of negative experiences. There were people who soared off the top of buildings under the impact of LSD, thinking they could fly, and of course, finding out that they couldn't really fly. Uh, some people went insane. Uh, using these psychedelics, again, because they weren't using it in the right context for the right indications with the right guidance. The mainstream uh, ideologues and politicians and scientific figures who were suspicious of psychedelics in the first place and who didn't like things happening that didn't occur under their control in the first place, then either in, they were inspired by these missteps or used them as an excuse to clamp down on the whole field of psychedelic research. So there's a retrenchment and a, a giving up of some very useful avenues of inquiry that persisted for decades until again the cultural crisis and the general inadequacy of mainstream medical perspectives led to a resurgence, which is what we're seeing now. And for the most part what we're seeing now is much more scientific and much more responsible use of these substances uh, with some of the dangers that also attended it in the 60s as well. And one of the other, uh, the fact that they're becoming much more mainstream, or one of the other areas of concern I know for some in the psychedelic community is that we now have corporate interest. We've got companies coming in that are uh, monetizing this. 
Are you concerned about that? Well, it's just a reality of the fact that uh, any economic system is the do economically dominant ones that will derive the profits from almost anything that's popular. That's just how it works. So cannabis is being legalized in Canada now. It's not going to be the little growers that are going to really profit. It's going to be huge corporations that are going to take advantage of the tax structure and the whole economic setup to make enormous profits. That's just how it works. Um, the thing with the psychedelics, um, say with ayahuasca, it's not a product that people will use every day. So if, when you make Prozac, people will have to use it daily. In fact, they use it daily for years. Ayahuasca is something you'll have ceremonies with two or three times a year, if you're a devotee, if you're a follower of it. So it's not as profitable because you don't get to sell mass uh, products to a large number of people on a daily basis. So there's less of a risk with that. But if psilocybin becomes useful as a, say, as a microdose, I can see corporations moving in. Under this system, I expect nothing else. It's less amenable to that kind of profit uh, motive because of the more intermittent nature of these uh, experiences and the small quantities involved. But nothing is immune to profit, and it is a profit to be made, yes. I expect the corporation to take advantage. Just going back to um, the psychedelic therapy, is there a sense that we can get insight from, from these experiences, but ultimately we have to do the work ourselves of integration and healing? Well, yeah. I've had deep experiences with psychedelics, really deep insights. I thought I understood the world. And I, I talk about this. Maybe 10 years ago, I led a retreat with ayahuasca. And under the impact of the plant, I was really a guru. I mean, I was really right on. I was you know, insightful and compassionate, and I could see through people's stuff, and I could guide them to reality. And I thought, okay, hey, I made it, folks. Then I arrive home, and my wife just picks me up at the train station, and, and she just had a haircut that I was totally upset by. All of a sudden, life wasn't worth living because of this haircut that my wife had. So here's a, this is how enlightened I got, you know? That's all of a sudden, I look at my partner, and I don't like what I see, and all of a sudden, I get all discombobulated. discombobulated. And that's my particular neurosis. But that Dioska experience and all the insights I had, they not liberated me from my neurosis. We having to have my woman looking a certain way. That's how dependent I still was. So the greatest insights and experiences lead you nowhere unless you integrate them. And as you say, that integration takes work. And so what I've learned and what I emphasize more and more now, in fact, what I emphasize most now, is the experience opens the door, but you're the one who has to walk through the door. And having the window open or the door open does not get you to the other side. And that's a lot of work. And so it's like with every other kind of spiritual work. You can also have great realizations on, on the meditation cushion. And people do have these direct experiences of, of godhood. But it leads them nowhere unless they transform their lives. And for it to transform their lives, those intentions and those uh, insights, those intuitions need to be integrated. And that's the daily work. And there's nothing that substitutes for daily work. And I have to say, people, if it's a question of having great insights on the one hand or daily regular work on the other, choose the daily work. Forget the great insights, forget the great experiences. Now, if you can combine the two, powerful support, one for the other. But the work is the key. Can you describe what that work is? The work may be different for everybody, uh, excuse me, but it doesn't involve some disengagement from the daily grind, some time that's devoted to your core essence or to exploring it. So for me, and with my ADHD, I was never a great meditator. I mean, I could sit through an meditation cushion and if I was present for 10 seconds out of 20 minutes, I could declare victory. However, I've also thought I wasn't a yoga person, but two years ago, I found a yoga practice. But if I don't do daily now, I suffer. And when I do do it, it really supports me. 
It puts me in touch with my body. It stills my mind. And it um, provides a break to my constantly running egoic mind. So that I experience myself as somebody different than just somebody who's always engaged in thought and talk and, 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 and process. Um, so that's my particular way. Uh, journaling, which is observing yourself and writing about it, so that there's that observer self that you're actually strengthening. An observer self is not the same as the daily rattled ordinary self. Um, group work. The, the Buddha talked about the Dharma, the Sangha, the, the Dharma, no, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Buddha meaning our inner two selves, the Dharma being the path, the Sangha being community. Are you having contact with others who are on the same path? Or do you just belong to a bunch of Facebook groups where you discuss what are the odds of Leicester City winning the uh, the FA Cup again, you know, so is there some connection with others who are on the same path? Uh, for some people it will be meditation, for some people it will be communing with nature, for some people it will be revisiting the psychedelic experience but without the plant, without the drug, without the substance, just putting himself in that space on a daily basis. Um, some, kind of, some kind of practice, some kind of practice, which has to be regular. Your work with ayahuasca, mm -hmm. and curious as to well, in fact, for any any listeners who aren't familiar with ayahuasca, what the experience is, could you give a, a short summary of, of what experientially and you know, what happens in an ayahuasca ceremony? Well, speaking of meaning, uh, it wasn't with ayahuasca. I'll come to that one moment. Mm -hmm. It was with another plant called iboga uh -huh. that I was participating in a ceremony earlier this year, and somebody asked me. What is the meaning of life? And, 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 and the, uh, this is what I was under the effect. And the immediate answer that came up is, life is its own meaning. Which I thought was a great line. I don't know that I can live that in my regular existence, but I thought it was the only answer that was needed. But it takes a lot to recognize that life is its own meaning. Um, now, yes, uh, after my book on addiction came out, <coughs> it just been published in England, but in North America, it appeared 10 years ago. I kept getting a lot of questions about what I knew about psychedelic plants, particularly ayahuasca, and the treatment of addiction. And my answer was I knew nothing at all until the answer, in fact, I should say the question became somewhat annoying to me because I just spent three years writing a book. How about asking me something I knew about rather than this one thing I didn't know about. But it so happened that I was exposed to the plant and I had the opportunity to experience its impact myself. And uh, at the first use of the plant, within a ceremony led by a Peruvian shaman, I understood why people were curious about its potential to, to, to work with uh, addiction because it provided a deep root to my own soul and to my heart uh, and also allowed me to observe just how close my heart had been. And of course addictions are all about shutting down some parts of ourselves that we would then have to enliven through artificial means. Uh, ayahuasca, this particular plant, also sometimes gives people a deep sense of their own suffering, of what is it that they've been running from all their lives. See, addiction is all about running away. It's a temporary running away for something unbearable. It's, it's that simple. And uh, the plant shows you what you've been running from which can be painful and difficult, but it shows you in a very compassionate way. So both in the sense of connecting you to a deep core self that doesn't have to run anywhere, and in terms of showing you just what you've been running away from, uh, it can be a deep experience in the right context. Yeah. I mean, I, I found from my own experiences, uh, many of them have been a sense of compassion combined with a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of, around, especially the, uh, the severely addicted people in the beginning of your book, you know, they, it seems that the, their pain is just, it's not, they don't have the capacity to bear it. Well, first of all, none of us who are addicted have the capacity to bear pain, otherwise they wouldn't be addicted. The, the problem with addiction is not the pain, the problem is that we don't know how to bear it. 
Now, why is it that we don't know how to bear it? Because the first time that we experience pain is in childhood. Now, if a child experiences pain, but there's adults there that can hold that child through that pain and, and, and show them that, yes, pain comes, but pain passes, that child will not be traumatized. The painful experience is not the same as being traumatized. Traumatized is when there's a restriction in our capacity to handle life. And, and the child, the infant, whose mother is depressed, for example, the mother loved the child. My mother loved me, but she was profoundly depressed throughout my first year of life and terrorized for historical reasons. She couldn't hold my pain. Um, she could hold me, but she couldn't hold my pain. Because for that, she needs to have something more than her own depression. She needs to be present and, and feeling somewhat optimistic that, OK, kid, you're in pain, but it'll pass. Now, the parent who's depressed or stressed can't hold the child in their pain. That child will not learn how to hold pain. That child will only learn how to escape from pain, to soothe it. Thumbs upping, rocking, masturbation, eating, and later on, addictions. So addictions are always about not knowing how to hold pain. Now, the more severe the pain is, and the more isolated the child is with the pain, the greater the risk for addiction. The cases I talk about in the beginning of the book, the really severe drug addicts, as you said, they've had horrendous experiences and nobody to help them hold it. Hence their incapacity to hold the pain. As you're talking about that, I'm also reminded of, um, you've talked a lot about A.H. Almas, a spiritual yeah. teacher, who's also been very influential on, on uh, my life. I see. And the, the concept of inquiry, which is a, a big, you know, kind of going in and it's got, I suppose a talking meditation um, you've, you've mentioned that ayahuasca is, uh, you see it as a process of inquiry as well. And that, that strikes me in some way because to be able to inquire into, for example, our pain or whatever it is, comes with a sense of, like implicit is a sense that I don't know. And there's a kind of... Not only there's an implicit sense that I don't know, but there's also I'm willing to find out. And there's also somebody there who's willing to find out. Yeah. So, pure pain, if there's no sense of the experiencer, just, you just want to escape from it. But as soon as you say, there's pain in me, and I'm curious what that's about, and I'm willing to look at it, there's immediately a sense of the inquirer, which is no longer identified with the pain, but is looking at it. So, that inquiry strengthens both her capacity to be with something and the person who is being with it. And so for me, the ayahuasca ceremony, like many meditations, is really an inquiry. It's not about, I want to have a beautiful experience of unity and godness and, and the angels and entities and the stars, which some people have. I've never had one. Um, but it's about what's going to arise and how shall I understand what arises. Yeah, I'm struck by the difference between that way of approaching contact with someone or, or ourselves and what we were talking about before with the, the very reactive nature of, of social media. Yeah. yeah, And you think by having those kind of dialogues with each other, we can get somewhere, you know, get out of our box in a sense. Is, is there some healing in just being able to have conversations like that? Well, uh, so in the context of the ayahuasca ceremony, at least the way I work with them, uh, there is contact before the ceremony. We people share our purpose. People indicate why they're there, what they're looking for. We help them identify their intention. Then there's the ceremony. And then after the ceremony, once we've people have slept and so on, then we talk about, well, what did you experience? And what meaning did you find in it? And what could be the meaning? of the symbols that maybe visited you, <clears throat> or the visions that you experienced, or the insights that you gained, or the physical sensations that your body um, went through. And uh, having that conversation in the context of a group immediately allows everybody's experience to be accompanied and shared. And it breaks through that isolation that so many of us experience. Mm. And the, the people who have been struggling with addiction and gone through a ceremony, what, what, kind, of, what kind of things are they reporting afterwards about what, what they experience and how are their lives afterwards? 
Well, um, I've seen people uh, break through significant addictions by means of uh, ayahuasca ceremonies, um, behavior addictions, drug addictions, and so on, uh, whether it was cocaine or sex. Um, having said that, the context and the follow-up and the integration have to be there. In other words, for most people, it's just not enough to have a beautiful experience or a deeply meaningful experience. What are they going to do with that in their lives? That's what we call integration. And in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is a concentrated area of drug use where I do um, spend quite some time in the book explaining and depicting the lives of these people, um, if these people come to ceremony, they might have beautiful, powerful insights and really get aspects of themselves that they've never experienced. But then they go back to the downtown east side, there's no supportive context, they'll relapse into their addiction, and I've seen that. So one mustn't idealize the ayahuasca experience as kind of the be-all and the end-all. There has to be a supportive, ongoing, integrative context. So we talked about A.H. Almas, and I'm curious, how, uh, how has his work influenced your own approach to your work and maybe to your life as well? I've had a number of, I've never had a spiritual mentor. It does not mean somebody that I've followed or particularly joined their group or, 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 or attended their teachings consistently. Um, I might question why I haven't done that, but basically I'm not a guru type. Uh, but, th but that doesn't mean that I haven't learned from a lot of people. I have, and Almas, Hamid Ali is his real name, H. Almas is his uh, nom de plume, if you wish. Um, he's been an influential teacher in my life. He's got these deep spiritual teachings, which I have to say, many of them I don't understand. Like, he talks about stuff I have no idea about, because he's had, he's had deep spiritual experiences of unity and transcendence that I haven't. So the language he uses, uh, I can only wonder about. Having said that, there's two major things that I've learned from him, which are absolutely essential to my understanding. One is the formation of the personality. We tend to identify with the personality. We think we are our personality. Almost points out, through a combination of Western psychology and Eastern spiritual uh, thought, that the personality is really a false construct. That the personality really is a defense against loss, a defense against pain. And so much of what we think of ourselves is actually a defensive structure. And we mustn't take it to be a reality. And that underneath that false personality, that defensive personality, there's a core self. And that core self can recognize the falseness of the personality and can transcend it. And he provides ways of working it through. And so he's very sophisticated in, in explaining the, uh, with a combina almost unparalleled combination of Western psychology and Eastern spiritual experience, the arising of the false personality and the kind of world that the false personality creates and how it keeps us trapped. And at the same time, how well, the personality does point to the truth in us. Because the things that the personality wants are real enough. Just like what the addiction wants is real enough. When I ask people, what does the addiction give you? And they'll say, um, comfort, uh, peace of mind, a connection with others, a sense of control, power. Well, those things are genuine qualities that people not only want, they actually have. But because of the first personality, false personality, we lost contact with them. So just as addiction points to the real human being, so does the personality. And I'm going to show some ways of working with that. And then again, he, he does talk about essence, which is the true nature of all of us that, that underlines all our dysfunctions and all our mm, misdirections. Mm -hmm. So in those senses, and then his inquiry has been very inspiring to me. So those are the main things I've learned from him. Um, again, when he, I don't say wanders, when he finds himself in more rarefied spiritual realms, I don't follow him there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just haven't done that work, I haven't had that experience. But I do believe him, mm -hmm. that, 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 that he's talking about genuine human experience and his own experience. Yeah. The, the concept of essence and the false personality is, is one of the most useful concepts for me from Amos as well. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious if, you've, if there was any sense when you were working especially down in, 
I'm going to ask the question again. What was the? It's, you it's, said downtown east side. A downtown east side. Sorry. Vancouver, yeah. So I'm I'm very curious. About, you know, this sense of essence for me from Almas is very um, very real, and I've experienced that in myself and seen it seen it in others. And I'm just wondering if downtown east side in Vancouver, working with um, the people you were working with, whether there were moments where you could kind of see an essence in oh, them. I could see it a lot of the time. Yeah. The tragedy is that the people themselves don't see it. They, they, they don't see their own essence. They're identified with their personality. They identify with their drives and with their dysfunctions, with their desperation. That's what they're identified with. And of course, society, for the most part, mirrors back to them the negative sense of self. In essence, as almost, I think, points out, needs to be seen in order to develop. But I. I've had more than a few glimpses of it, uh, and uh, th there's that tragedy between when you look at somebody's essence and who they really are, and then a level on which they function because they got cut off from their essence, or at least their connection with essence, a long, long time ago. Dr. Gaber Mate, thank you very much. Oh, my great pleasure. Thank you.